and uh, good morning, everybody. Today, we are going to have a look at a number of useful eDNA applications and how it can be used across a variety of sectors. We will then go through three case studies from surveys that we have conducted over the past few years. Specifically, we will look at an eDNA pilot study sampling for the endangered Jefferson salamander in southwestern Ontario. Then we went to a pilot survey to monitor the invasive chain pickerel and smallmouth bass in Maritime Canada. Our last case study taking place at an industrial site in Northern Ontario will compare results of conventional electrofishing methods with our eDNA detection. To conclude today's presentation, we will compare and contrast the various eDNA methodologies that are currently being used globally, and we'll discuss why not all eDNA methods are equal. The synthesis of field-ready tools has enabled a fully integrated on-site detection platform with a wide range of applications that extend well beyond the detection of only the species featured in today's case studies. At the heart of our eDNA point of need platform is the ability to, do, to efficiently and non-invasively monitor broad-scale biodiversity with a high degree of precision. While much of our work has been done with aquatic animal species, our platform offers much more, including the potential to monitor terrestrial species, the detection of groundwater pathogens that may impact upon human health, the early detection of uh, pathogens that affect agriculture and aquaculture, and also in forest pest surveillance. eDNA was first used in 2008 as a tool for detecting the presence of an aquatic invasive species, the American bullfrog, in low abundances. Since its inception, eDNA has been realized as an extremely useful tool for biomonitoring of almost any species. The high sensitivity of eDNA methods allows us to effectively monitor species in very low abundances without having to physically capture specimens, saving time, costs, and providing more accurate information about habitat occupancy. While eDNA began as a presence or absence tool, it can be used to answer a vast range of questions for species at risk, invasive, keystone, and indicator species. With species at risk, we can apply eDNA methodologies to improve biomonitoring efficiency and to aid in restoration efforts. For example, using temporal sampling, we can monitor reintroduction efforts over time to track habitat usage. This can also be applied to monitoring the effectiveness of habitat restoration initiatives, such as monitoring the adoption of artificial spawning grounds constructed specifically for species at risk fishers. As a non-invasive technique, we do not need to enter the water or physically capture any specimens, which helps preserve both the species environments and reduces stress applied upon the target organisms. This, of course, also helps when considering sampling permits, as permits are easier to acquire for collecting water samples, which in, can in turn help expedite projects and reduce costs associated with obtaining those permits for species at risk biomonitoring. For invasive species, we can use eDNA surveys to track invasion fronts and to monitor the success of invasion control efforts. We can also use eDNA survey data to help make decisions about invasive species management, for example, determining sites for construction of physical barriers to um, impede upstream migration of potentially injurious species. Beyond this, eDNA can be used to monitor keystone and indicator species for numerous branches of industry where the status of single species delivers important information about the overall health of an ecosystem and the impact that industrial activity may be having on surrounding ecosystems. The survey approaches in the previous examples are typically done using the highly accurate and efficient qPCR targeted approach. But a metagenomics approach may also be used for characterizing entire communities. While this approach may not match qPCR in terms of cost and detection probability, it is still an effective tool for broad scale biomonitoring. We can use our on site detention platform to monitor for the presence of a host of pathogens, including infectious bacteria, viruses, and protists, some of which are listed on this slide. In these cases, we bend the definition of eDNA because we are no longer looking for trace DNA left behind from the host. Rather, we are physically capturing the living microbes on the filter paper. Nonetheless, DNA can be extracted from samples in a matter of minutes, and the presence and quantity of infectious agents can be identified on site 
without waiting weeks for laboratory results. In the case of aquaculture, instead of waiting for fish to present with disease symptoms, eGNA methods may be used as a preemptive technique to detect the presence of pathogens, even in very low numbers, uh, before the presentation of symptoms. Likewise, E. coli testing can be done on-site at public beaches, enabling a much faster response to outbreaks. Vector-borne diseases also can be detected by capture of the host and subsequent DNA extraction from vector tissue. For example, we can detect tick-borne pathogens causing Lyme disease, such as Borrelia burgdorferi. At this point, I'll hand over proceedings to Kevin. <coughs> Thank you, Steve, for the excellent uh, overview on eDNA applications. Now, having reviewed some of the many applications for eDNA, we will dive into some real-life case studies on eDNA surveys that we have conducted alongside our collaborators. The first of which will be examining a validation study of the elusive and endangered Jefferson salamander. The Jefferson salamander is characterized by a dark gray or brown back with lighter underparts with light bluish gray flecks along the flanks and tail in some individuals. As you may know, the Jefferson is particularly difficult to identify morphologically with significant similarities to the blue spotted salamander and the ambistoma unisexual. The Jefferson species is in, is in serious decline due to habitat loss, pollution of breeding ponds and disturbance to migratory routes. Similarly, the Jefferson dependent unisexual species is also now listed as endangered. With overlapping distributions of these nearly indistinguishable species, conservation efforts can be complicated. With varying COSOEC statuses across similar species, environmental co consultants and developmental firms need a way to quickly and easily distinguish between these species to help conserve the Jefferson population and to keep projects moving along. And this is one area where eDNA can certainly help. Our team developed triple lock eDNA assays for the detection of the Jefferson salamander, the blue spotted, and the ambistoma unisexual. These assays were first lab validated and tested for specificity using reliable tissue samples, not only from each species, but also other closely related non-target species. We then teamed up with Stantec Consulting Limited to conduct a robust field validation survey in historically positive and negative sites to test the reliability and the sensitivity of the Jefferson salamander assay when deployed in the field with our on-site detection platform. As a validation study, our surveying strategy was designed to accommodate numerous geographically separate sites while also remaining financially feasible. We sampled 10 sites six of which were historically negative, and the remaining four were positive sites using historical records obtained as of 2011. At each of the 10 sites, we sampled using the Smith Root Andy system to collect three biological replicate samples. For each sample, we filtered one liter of water using one micron filter pore sizes. DNA extractions were performed on site using the Biomeme M1 sample prep kit and QPCR, QPCR analyses were also performed on site using two Biomeme 23 thermocyclers. Three QPCR technical replicates were prepared for each of the biological replicate samples for a total of nine QPCR sample tests per vernal pool. In addition, no template controls or NTCs and positive controls using synthetic target DNA were run alongside the samples of interest to test for contamination and also to ensure that all components of the qPCR analyses were functional. So here are our results from this Jefferson eDNA survey. We detected the Jefferson salamander in all historically positive sites. We further confirmed these results by non-invasive genetic characterization of empty salamander egg jelly using our eDNA markers. Note that for vernal pool E, which is marked with an asterisk, we sequenced DNA from the site using Sanger sequencing to further corroborate the positive results. Now, one of the most interesting findings was that of Vernal Pool J. This was a negative site according to historical records obtained in 2011. However, we detected a population of Jeffersons using this pool. So how come historical records failed to identify Jeffersons in this location? 
Well, in 2011, surveyors captured 373 salamanders from the vernal pool. This effectively gathered a, sam a subsample of the overall salamander population. They then selected 20 of the captured salamanders for genetic characterization, and none of which turned out to be Jefferson. However, all of these were Jefferson dominant unisexuals. Now, of course, some of the salamanders in the total population of this pool were in fact Jefferson, but they remained undetected by conventional methods because not all of the salamanders in the pool could be tested. It's just not feasible. In conclusion of this case study on the Jefferson salamander, our on-site eDNA detection platform yielded results that were highly concordant with historical data. We detected Jefferson populations in all of the vernal pools where they were suspected to be, and we even uncovered a Jefferson population in a vernal pool where they were not previously known to be, which really highlights the reliable sensitivity and accuracy of our eDNA methods. Now, one last note on the Jefferson. We often get questions asking how we can distinguish between closely related species, particularly with the Jefferson dominant unisexual and the blue spotted dominant unisexual. So we have included an inference table to describe how we can infer the presence of either species. If we detect the Jefferson and the Ambostoma unisexual salamanders, we can infer with confidence that the Jefferson dominant unisexuals that are present also have Jefferson salamanders present. Likewise, if we detect the blue spotted salamander and the unisexual, then we can be confident that the unisexual species that is present is blue spotted dominant. By extension, if we detect all three species, it is highly likely that the unisexuals present contain a combination of both Jefferson and blue spotted dominant individuals. The only scenario where we cannot make inferences with confidence is when the unisexual alone is detected with no Jefferson or blue spotted salamanders present. While we have never encountered this, we cannot rule out the situation. Thankfully, due to the high sensitivity of our assays, it's very unlikely that we would ever detect the unisexual salamander in the absence of either parental species. Now for our second case study, we're going to have a look at how eDNA has been used to monitor invasive species in Nova Scotia, Canada, and how eDNA surveys can help make informed decisions about invasive species management. The chain pickerel and smallmouth bass are two non-native top predator species in Nova Scotian lakes, and they spread into approximately five to ten new freshwater lakes per year. Smallmouth bass was intentionally introduced into five lakes in the 1940s, and this was for recreational fishing, but the species has now established itself into over 144 lakes in Nova Scotia. Unfortunately, the same is true of the chain pickerel, which was illegally introduced into three Nova Scotian lakes and is now found in over 95 lakes, including the Petite Riviere lakes, which is home to the last remaining population of Atlantic whitefish in the world. As apex predators, the chain pickerel and smallmouth bass can significantly disrupt native populations. For this eDNA project, we worked in collaboration with Parks Canada within and adjacent to Kejimakujik National Park and Historic Site. The high sensitivity of eDNA methods can enable park managers and wildlife biologists to rapidly detect invasive species and counter the pejorative impacts of such species like the chain pickerel and small wolf bass, in addition to the other factors that continue to threaten populations of species at risk and overall ecosystem functioning. Now at the bottom line, having better, more sensitive detection capabilities enables a faster response and a better chance of controlling invasive species. When invasive species prevention fails and a new species enters an environment, Wildlife biologists and those working on the front lines have to act quickly to control the spread of the invasion. In these cases, physical barriers may be constructed to stop the spread. This can only be effective if the species hasn't made its way beyond the proposed barrier site. So one component of this particular survey was to test for the presence of chain pickerel and smallmouth bass at a proposed site for a physical barrier. At the early stages of an invasion, species are present in very low numbers and may not be detected whatsoever until a viable population is established. But since eDNA methods can detect species in very low abundance, 
It's a highly fit tool for detecting invasive species early and can help to verify the suitability of sites for physical barriers. This survey was designed as a pilot study to help determine the best sampling strategy for future projects in Keji. We collected samples from eight sites within and adjacent to the park, including the proposed barrier site. As shown in the table on the right, each site was either thought to be positive for the invaders, negative, or not yet known based on historical data. At each site, five one liter biological replicate samples were taken, all of which were within 100 meters of each other, which helped to increase spatial coverage. We conducted qPCR sample analyses in triplicate for a total of 15 qPCR reactions per site. Metadata was also collected alongside the samples as per standard pilot study protocols. The chain pickerel assay was used for samples collected from five sites, two of which were negative sites, two were positive sites, and one was unknown. Upon analyses, we detected chain pickerel in the unknown site, which confirmed suspicions that the chain pickerel had entered the Lower Mercy River system. Now, eDNA did not detect chain pickerel in one positive site, Minamkiak Lake. We attribute this false negative to high acidity and PCR inhibitors present in the water, as well as insufficient sampling resolution for this large body of water. Of course, as a pilot study, we did anticipate some false negatives, and so any future sampling at this site will indeed see increased sampling resolution and extensive PCR inhibitor treatment. The smallmouth bass assay was employed on samples collected from all eight sites. Four of these sites were historically negative, three were historically positive, and one was unknown. We encountered one false negative at the Lower Mercy River site, which was a known positive site where eDNA detection at the pilot study resolution failed to detect. Again, future sampling at this site will require increased sampling resolution and downstream processing for PCR inhibitors. Sadly, in all historically negative sites, we did detect the smallmouth bass, indicating that the invasion front had progressed well beyond what was currently expected by park staff. Perhaps the most important finding of this study was at the proposed barrier site. This site, the Pescoesk Brook, which forms an entrance to the aquatic systems of Keji, was expected to be negative for both chain pickerel and smallmouth bass, and was proposed as an optimal site for a physical barrier to keep these invasive predators out. We unfortunately detected a smallmouth bass population both below and above the site for the proposed physical barrier, indicating that the species had already moved beyond the site for the barrier. While this was unexpected and very unfortunate news, there are some positive aspects. By revealing that the species was already established in this location, Parks Canada staff and others managing the invasion could redirect their efforts and hundreds of thousands of dollars in funding could be spent elsewhere to control the invasion. For our third and final case study of today's presentation, we're gonna have a look at how, we're gonna have a comparative, a look at comparing between conventional biomonitoring methods and environmental DNA methods at an industrial site in Northern Ontario. In this study, we selected two species of interest. We compare results of brook trout and burbot eDNA monitoring to conventional two-pass electrofishing. This survey took place on an industrial site at which a natural section of stream was rerouted for development purposes. In accordance with the required required remedial actions, the stream was reconstructed with prime brook trout spawning habitat to mirror the original natural stream. Brook trout was selected because biologically, they're considered an indicator species due to their exceptional sensitivity to environmental changes. Therefore, monitoring the brook trout can reveal the overall health of the ecosystem. Now, in addition to the brook trout, we also surveyed for burbot eDNA, which is a common species in this system based on contemporary records. We elected to survey for burbot alongside the brook trout to determine if results gathered 
from both eDNA and two-pass electrofishing would yield significant correlations between the two methods. In doing so, we could investigate the potential for eDNA results to be used as a proxy of a verbit abundance in this system. To understand the survey design of this study, let's first consider what the objectives were. Having strategically designed this new segment of stream to harbor strong brook trout populations, as well as prime spawning grounds, our client sought to determine if non-invasive eDNA methods could be used to monitor brook trout populations and yield results of similar or even better resolution than conventional methods, such as electrofishing. The secondary objective was to determine if eDNA results correlate with electrofishing results, such that eDNA biomonitoring could provide a proxy of verbit abundance in the system. So in this head-to-head -head comparison of eDNA and electrofishing, we sampled 11 sites along a five kilometer stretch of anthropogenic stream where brook trout were suspected to be based on contemporary records obtained by conventional methods. We also sampled three points in a second stream where brook trout do not reside, and we use this as a negative control site. In both systems, samples were collected starting from the most downstream site to prevent cross-contamination. At each site, eDNA samples were taken first, followed by metadata samples, including temperature, total suspended solids, pH, and conductivity. Electrofishing was then conducted in 10 meter stretches at each site. Our eDNA sampling strategy was designed as a high resolution study for detecting species in low abundance, such as the brook trout. At each of the 14 sites, we collected three one liter biological replicate samples and extracted the DNA on site. We then analyzed the DNA extracts with six qPCR technical replicates per biological sample for a total of 18 qPCR tests per site. This strategy was, of course, complemented by two pass electrofishing, in which blocking nets were used to isolate a 10 meter stretch of the stream at each site. The results of this high resolution eDNA survey and comparative study were quite remarkable. As you can see by viewing the DNA double helices, denoting a detection event on the stream diagram, we detected brook trout in two and a half times more spawning sites than electrofishing, which is denoted by a lightning bolt on the stream diagram. Brook trout were captured by electrofishing in sites two and site eight, and at each of these two sites, only a single specimen was observed. However, eDNA methods detected brook trout in five sites along the five kilometer stretch of creek, including the two sites where the brook trout were physically captured by electrofishing. As expected, no brook trout were, were detected in system two, either by electrofishing or eDNA methods, as this was a negative control site. These results in high concordance with the literature truly highlight the sensitive nature of eDNA methods compared with conventional methods and provide strong evidence that eDNA surveying is an effective tool for monitoring keystone species, such as the brook trout. Now, burbit were physically captured by two-pass electrofishing in very healthy numbers in all sites but site one. Similarly, eDNA analyses revealed strong levels of detection in all sites but site two. We applied a linear regression of DNA copy number per site with numbers of burbit captured by electrofishing per site. We found that after an additional PCR, removal, PCR inhibitor removal step, concentrations of eDNA extracted from water samples correlated very nicely with burbit abundance. Ultimately, this was a prime example of the utility that eDNA biomonitoring offers. We detected brook trout, a species characterized by low abundance in the system with two and a half times better sensitivity than conventional methods, of course, without causing any disturbance to the site or placing any stresses on the fish. And we also made progress on answering one of the most commonly asked questions. Can eDNA predict abundance? Our findings suggest that we may be able to infer species abundance, at least for common species like the burbot, and for now in small lentic systems, but we expect this to change as the science progresses. 
So we're now going to change gears and wrap up this presentation by having a look at some of the various eDNA methods, and we'll show how having a customizable approach enables greater target species detection probability. If we look at eDNA methods as a whole, we can categorize the process into five main steps. These include assay design, pilot study, survey design, sampling methodologies, and sample processing and qPCR analyses. Each of these steps are equally important in order to achieve the maximum probability of target species detection and to minimize the risk of false negatives and contamination. Assay design is a critically important step in eDNA methods. Assays should always be designed in a standardized fashion and must be optimized and validated on the qPCR instruments that will be used to analyze samples. Publicly available assays from the literature may report high qPCR efficiency and sensitivity. However, further examination of many of these assays in our own labs reveal very poor replicability, often requiring re-optimization, which adds additional costs, times, and begins to stray away from the Mikey standards. At Precision Biomonitoring, we use our proprietary triple lock assay development method, and this yields qPCR assays with superior accuracy and precision. We develop all assays in-house using the same methods and instruments that samples are run on. This allows us to have confidence in results, knowing that the assay was developed in a standardized fashion minimizing all methodological variants often found when using publicly available assays. To truly confirm our assays performance, all of our triple lock assays receive unbiased third-party validation by an institution with the highest level of international laboratory standards, the ISO 17025. Our experience has shown that conducting a pilot study before mobilizing a large scale study is absolutely essential. During the pilot study, important metadata will be collected to serve as the basis for the survey design. It also gives us the opportunity to verify water properties and the layout of the study site. All of this ensures that upon return to the site, we have a statistically sound sampling scheme to help maximize the probability of detection. Survey design is perhaps the most vital factor in eDNA methods. To design a statistically robust eDNA survey, one must consider all of the variables that influence the probability of detecting rare eDNA, such as species ecology, water quality, pH, turbidity, species biology, time of year, and many other important factors. By failing to acknowledge these variables, results will not be reflective of the true occupancy of eDNA, and the probability of detecting the target species dwindles. At Precision Biomonitoring, we have just filed a patent on standard methods to, to design customized surveys that maximize the power, accuracy, and precision of the survey. Our bioinformaticians are now developing a software tool to enable the survey design method. There are also a host of sample collection methods, and the chosen method can greatly affect the chances of capturing elusive traces of eDNA. For example, collecting surface water samples of varying volumes into Nalgene bottles for analyses when targeting a bottom dwelling species is almost guaranteed to fail. Furthermore, rare or cryptic species can be extremely hard to detect, requiring the collection of large volumes of water to maximize the probability of eDNA detection. And again, collecting small volumes of surface water will not give you statistically valid results that you can trust. At Precision Biomonitoring, we rely on the proven ANDI system by Smith Root. The ANDI system allows us to meet the demands of the recommended survey design with adjustable sample volume, ability to collect transecting samples, not only at the water's surface, but also at depth, and the one-way flow system paired with single-use filters and rigorous decontamination procedures really minimize the risk of contamination in the field. Another step in eDNA methods that may impact the reliability of the results is sample preservation. eDNA continues to degrade after sample collection and ideally should be extracted on the spot. 
Water samples or filters shipped to a central lab and despite preservation methods, all have a risk of ongoing degradation of the precious traces of eDNA. And this really increases the chance of encountering false negative results. Long transit times further increase the risk of false negatives. We have found that the most reliable way to mitigate eDNA degradation is to extract the eDNA from the filters immediately on site and into thermostable buffer solution. We do this using the two minute Biomeme M1 eDNA sample prep kit. By doing on site DNA extractions, we not only eliminate the risk of DNA degradation, but we also significantly reduce the risk of cross contamination, which is another major concern in central laboratories. Lastly, there are several analytical approaches for qPCR analyses of eDNA samples. At precision biomonitoring, we optimize our assays for multiplexing. This allows us to run duplexed samples with an internal positive control or IPC. An IPC is an absolute necessity to control against false negative results. This is because the IPC can help detect the presence of PCR inhibitors and any other qPCR issues that may impact the integrity of the test, such as the quality of qPCR primers, probes, and master mix. Using the IPC alongside eDNA samples, again, helps to bolster confidence in results. Other variables to consider with eDNA sample analyses include the number of PCR cycles used, the use of a non-template control, or NTC, to test for contamination, and the use of a positive control using synthetic DNA, known as G-blocks. And that's all I have for you today, folks. I'm now going to turn the mic back over to Mario to wrap up today's webinar. Thank you for listening. We really appreciate you taking the time out of your day to learn more about eDNA, as well as what we are doing at Precision Biomonitoring to help progress the science. Thank you very much, um, Steve and Kevin, for this informa informative uh, presentation. Thank you all for your participation. As we have seen and heard, many applications of eDNA are indeed reliable if and only if conducted with statistically sound survey designs with a proper pilot study with proven sampling methods and sample preparation and with an accurate and validated qPCR test. It is a science and a process, a lot more sophisticated than a simple grab and go ship to a lab. We now invite you to ask any question you may have by clicking on the question button below the presentation and writing them down in the space provided. Kevin, Steve, or I will strive to answer your question as best as we can. While you are writing your questions, I would like to draw your attention to the potential of forging strategic partnerships with precision biomonitoring. If this is of interest to your organization, please contact Doris Kamar, our business development director, uh, at uh, the telephone number or email on this um, uh, slide, and uh, Doris would be very keen to discuss your interest.